Hello, and welcome to this edition of Highlights from the Hill. I'm here all by my lonesomes because my co-host, Superintendent Dr. Kathy McLeod, is actually going to be doing the bulk of this show. We're getting close to town meeting, and Dr. McLeod is going to be giving us the presentation that she will be presenting on the floor at town meeting. We wanted to bring it to you now so you could have a chance to look at the numbers and think about all the things that the school system is accomplishing. So take it away, Dr. McLeod. Welcome, and thank you to HCAM for this opportunity to provide an overview of the school department's budget in preparation for town meeting beginning May 1st. This year's budget, as every year, is focused on the school department's mission, learn, create, and achieve together. And I just want to take a minute to thank the school committee and the community. So as always, our uh, budget is planned around the strategic plan. The strategic plan is an ongoing, we refresh it every year, we take a look at what have we accomplished within our strategic initiatives and what are areas where we need to really focus um, our priorities, our school improvement plans, which then informs our budget planning. So here's an example of the strategic initiative supporting this particular budget. Um, I'd really like to point out the adoption of the new science standards under aligned curriculum. Each year we will take a different component of the curriculum to focus um, and we do this in a way that we know what's coming up next and we know what needs to be provided. Um, matching curriculum expectations with individual learning needs. This really refers to a modified specialized curriculum that we've been working closely with the special education department to ensure that students on, on individual education plans are being provided with the very best instruction that's aligned with the, um, the curriculum, the Mass State curriculum. Uh, in addition, we are really looking at using student assessment results to establish high expectations. This is an ongoing goal that's been part of our strategic plan for the past several years. We now have a, completed the cycle of the preschool program evaluation, so that will result in some changes to the preschool program that have been planned for within the budget. Um, and finally, student assessment, so using this learning data to plan for and adjust instruction um, that helps us to evaluate student learning and more importantly to plan for targeted instruction that can help students to, to take that next step. Under create, this is, um, this is probably I think one of the more important parts of our mission. So learn, we talked about the learning piece and the strategic plan, but when we think about create, something that makes us really proud in this town is that we provide an education that focuses on the whole child. And in doing so, we really believe that this provides opportunities for students to be available for learning. The fact that they have access to social emotional wellness um, curriculum and programs, um, our clubs, everything that's going on, all of the improvements in engineering that have been uh, part of our budget presentation. You've heard us talk about it, arts and we just had athletics and music on the most recent highlights from the Hill. You'll be hearing from the arts department. All of these things together result in an education that focuses on the whole child. And I'm really delighted on the next slide to show you some results from the Metro West Adolescent Health Survey report over the past 10 years. And you can see some incredible declines in, in behaviors that are being reported in our middle school, our seventh and eighth graders, around cigarette smoking, alcohol use, et cetera. Um, these are things, when you look at these reductions, that are, we feel, a result of the slide before. All of the opportunities for kids to release stress, um, to make healthy choices are things that we're really proud about that we provide in, in our school and in our, in our curriculum. Um, an area of concern, of course, that we continue to see is that life is continued to be uh, expressed as very stressful. But on the, on the flip side of that, it seems that students are making better choices about how to deal with that stress. And again, we're excited in our schools um, to feel that we're at least a part of that solution. The next slide shows us, um, oh, we're already on it, similar results at the high school with re reductions. I have listed um, the same, the same um, bullet points in terms of the, some of the choices, and you can see these reductions 
Um, I will point out, I mean, cigarette smoking, of course, but, you know, even when we look at fighting on school property, um, we're, we're, we pride ourselves with the fact that, that it's, this is typically not a problem in our schools. We provide anyone who's been to the high school or the middle school um, will attest to the fact that the environment is just so student friendly and so, so student focused. Um, and kids have lots of choices. So again, you see that kids are reporting that life is very stressful, but similarly, that the choices that they're making to, to manage that stress um, seem to be improving. Underachieve. Uh, we, again, we, we are so excited that we have not only these great results around student stress and student choices and lifestyle choices, but our achievement continues to increase. Elmwood had the best overall MCAS performance in the past four years, and that is in both ELA and mathematics. I'll point out at the Elmwood School, for those of you who are not Elmwood parents, that we only test third graders at Elmwood. There is no MCAS for second grade. Um, so this would be our Elmwood School, and we are confident uh, that this is the result of the work from kindergarten through third grade, because that's the first time that they're actually tested. So these results, um, teachers, from kindergarten through third grade are to be congratulated for achieving the best overall performance um, in the past four years. At the middle school, we were delighted in the fall to report that um, the middle school met level one proficiency rating, which is a, an achievement that they reached uh, due to narrowing the gap um, for our high needs learners. So congratulations to the middle school, our middle school and our high school are now both level one schools. Um, and our high school was ranked fifth in the state. I'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. 82% um, of our students participated in APs and we had a 99% graduation rate. At the Hopkins School, I call this out separately because it's a little bit more subtle, but at the, high, at the Hopkins School, you can see the student growth percentiles. And what this does is it compares student performance with their like peers across the state. So it's not comparing student to student within a classroom, but student growth looks at comparing students across the state with, with students who have similar profiles. We've really been targeting our high need students and our students with disabilities as part of the strategic plan, as I pointed out earlier. Um, and you can just see that the growth and in this case, we want to see a higher number. The growth in student growth for our high need students um, in two years has gone from 40 SGP or student growth percentile to 61. And for students with disabilities from 34 to 62. Um, Hopkins has much to be congratulated for. That's an incredible achievement. The uh, target is 40 to 60. And the fact that we're at the top of that range for our high needs students, both our high needs and students with disabilities, high needs including low income students and second language learners as well as students with disabilities um, is a really wonderful achievement. And it calls to, again, the strategic plan and the focus of instruction as well as materials and supplies and professional development that we have provided uh, to our teachers to help them to achieve this goal. I also wanted to point out the impact from the past few years. So this is an impact from providing targeted and early intervention, team-based support, and programmatic changes that have been supported by all of you in past budgets. And the result that I'm showing you here is the numbers of students who, need, who are in need for specialized instruction. Just take a moment to explain this to you because it's a really important thing to understand. Um, the goal is not to reduce the need for special education. The goal is to reduce the need for specialized instruction. And what that means is that if we can provide students with the instruction that they need within the regular general education program, with the support of all teachers, and this is what we've been doing in all of our schools, we can realize a decline in the numbers of students who cannot learn with, within the generalized program of instruction. And you can see over the past three years a reduction in all three of our elementary schools. Um, at the center school from 7.4 percent two years ago to 6.6 percent. These are the percentage of kids needing specialized instruction. Um, at the Elmwood school 9.2 percent from 11 
0.4, and then at Hopkins, kind of um, echoing or mirroring the slide I just showed you with the reduction in the needs there or the improvements in student growth from 13.7 to 10. What this means is that we're able to provide students um, by using all of our all of our staff with adjustments to their instructional program that meets their needs, their individualized and special needs, without having to provide a specialized program outside of the general curriculum. So learn, create, achieve together. And I love this slide. This slide was provided by uh, Mrs. Bellello and her students and staff at the Hopkins School at the very beginning of the year. And it has uh, been a symbol for their school uh, throughout the year, but we love this this photo. These are all of our children, um, and and the, the fact that together we provide an education together, meaning the schools and the boards and the town and the parents, um, an education that focuses on the whole child, and uh, for that we're we're very appreciative. So just quickly run through the budget development um, because the budget, of course, supports everything else that I've just talked about. Um, the original request resulted in an almost 7% increase. And this is really how the school committee works with the, each of the schools and with me um, and with Mr. Dumas to look at what, what are the original requests within the budget. And then what we like to do is look at what, what's the impact over all of our programs. Um, once we've looked at that, then we can then we have further reductions, further meetings, further discussions across all of our schools to determine where the priorities are, compared up against the strategic plan. So what's within our strategic plan this year that we absolutely need to keep in place? What can wait? Where are there areas that we could stop doing some things that we've been doing in order to change, bring in some new changes? Um, that, that part of our budget work that happens through the month of November resulted in a 2.86% reduction um, that brought us to a 4.13% uh, overall increase in our budget ask for this year. On the next slide, you'll see the overview, and this is an important one. We point it out every year, but it's really to show that the payroll percent remains the same from year to year. Um, it's always very close to 82%, which leaves us only 18% of the budget um, to really support a varied initiatives. Now, we do have some opportunities within payroll when we're making hiring decisions around support, uh, support personnel, um, or some programmatic changes that will require additional staffing, uh, an adjustment council, counselor last year, uh, additional ELL teachers comes to mind as a result of increased students with second language needs. Um, those are always looked at within payroll, and we are challenged with where can we make reductions. We're really proud of the fact that within uh, the fact that we have to make increases, you can see that we're level. Uh, we really don't increase the, our percentage of payroll, we work to make reductions in order to keep it, keep it pretty, um, pretty consistent. And then within all of this good news, uh, it's really important that we really celebrate where we are in comparison to some of the, the towns uh, that we compare ourselves to, um, both within our per pupil expenditure and how well we do within the state. So as I reported earlier, um, our high school is ranked fifth in the state. And you can see where we are within the surrounding comparable towns um, as far as our per pupil expenditure. What I don't have on here is population or number of students that we serve. But I can tell you that within these comparisons, we also have one of the highest um, you know, numbers of students. So we're really proud of the fact that we continue to spend um, your dollars wisely, um, that we remain at a fairly low per pupil expenditure, comparatively speaking. And within that, we're still able to provide all of the wonderful programs um, that are funded in this budget um, and, and perform as well as we do. So this is a really important comparison, I think, when we think about all of the achievements and all of the programs and all of the wonderful things happening in our schools. 
And finally, uh, I just want to end by also mentioning that on an annual basis, we're provided with or presented with unfunded mandates that come to us from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education um, or from the state, um, requiring us to provide additional or certain things. Um, and these requirements come without funding, and they sometimes come without warning. Um, often we're given some warning, and we can plan for it within the budget, but within that planning, we, there are other things that we're not able to do. So here's just an example of some of the things that have come to us. Um, the, the science standards we've known about for a while, the ELL requirement as well, um, not only the training, but the requirement for students. Um, we did learn that those requirements had changed significantly around the amount of instruction that they needed to receive. Um, those requirements changed without any additional funding for additional teachers. Um, and then you can see some other things that we have coordinated program review took place this past year. Um, and the MSBA assessment kind of came out of the blue and required a significant amount of time on the part of our buildings and grounds department um, when, when they needed to dedicate their time. So these are things that I just want to point out that the school department and all of the departments take on. Um, and we're, we're, because we begin or we actually the school committee votes the school department's budget in January, some of these unfunded mandates come along when we have not had an opportunity to budget for them and requires some difficult decisions um, throughout the year. So uh, there, that is my overview. I hope that that provided some additional information um, that maybe you do not get um, or have not had in the past. And our hope and the school committee's hope was that by providing this overview, um, you will be able to come to town meeting uh, informed in terms of what is included and why the school department's budget is what it is. Okay, now that was a really informative and fact-filled presentation. I'd like to thank Dr. McLeod for putting that together and welcome back to the set of our show. Thank you. As always, a pleasure to be here. Yes. Now, the one thing I wanted to ask, mm -hmm. because there is so much information that is on those slides, you know, so many um, numbers and uh, you have years of data now. It's really interesting to me it, how clear it is that this community is on an upward track as far as taking care of all the students that are going through and enriching their educational experience. Yeah, thank you for noticing that. I think there's so much information to share and it's always a challenge to, to try to decide what the highlights are. Um, obviously the focus was to explain to folks that this is what the budget, this is what the money, this is what the town dollars um, is allowing us to do within our school mm -hmm. department. But also, I wanted to really, we, the school committee and myself, um, we wanted to really help people to understand that we have important choices to make. And we make them based on, you know, student, student achievement, student success, but student success in all areas. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the, the kind of the highlights that we were trying to give in the budget. There's so much more to tell and there's so many more details behind the highlights. Right. Um, right. But I'm glad that you noticed that because that was the whole point. Yeah, and what's so interesting is the amount of data that must be behind that because there are so many different types of information going on. There are unfunded mandates, yes. there are changes in curriculum. I mean, this world is ever changing and becoming more and more complex and you know you are a professional at the top and the school committee are a bunch of volunteers spending their time and all this information has to flow through you to come out to town meeting to explain what the townspeople are actually funding. Well thank you for mentioning the volunteer piece Jim because I think that that's something that we should really point out here today. Mm -hmm. um, as we approach town meeting and as we come off of the marathon, yes. you know, just again, just so many volunteers helping to make that wonderful celebration happen. But all of a sudden, a town meeting is in front of us, and we have an opportunity Monday night um, with Educate Hopkinton to to uh, meet together the different departments to prepare people for Know Your Vote. And mm -hmm. I think that's a wonderful opportunity. That's also prepared by volunteers who are sharing information and 
getting voters out so that people can come to town meeting feeling like they are informed. Yeah. Um, we have, of course, the HPTA and all of the things that they do for our schools and the Hawkington Education Foundation mm -hmm. um, to help us to fund things that otherwise wouldn't have been funded in our budget. Right. I mean, we really depend on those folks and all of the hours and hours of volunteerism um, that they provide. We mm -hmm. just had last week at the school committee meeting um, the a fund that was providing furniture for a science lab, um, the trustees of the schools. Mm -hmm. And that's another group of volunteers that come and are you know, eager to provide funding for things that the school, the budget would otherwise not have been able to fund. Right. Um, and you mentioned the school committee. I don't, I mean, we do have to make a show, and we've talked about this in the future, to really highlight the individuals that give so much time yes. to the town, um, pr volunteering their time to really, these folks really understand the details of this budget and they right. make sure that they understand mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> by working with all of us to, to provide their support. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's so complex and it's large. It is so large. And what I find amazing is just the smartness you know what I mean? Like when, when the teachers are asking for grants and the, uh, the Huffington Education Foundation, the HPT are getting involved, it's like really cool stuff. And it's very complimentary and it helps build upon what the administration is able to provide that results in the type of achievements that you showed in your presentation. Well, I'm smiling, Jim, because I feel like all we ever have to do is keep up with the kids. Mm -hmm. So when you say it's really smart, yeah. it has to be, because <laughs> our kids are just so outstanding. Yeah. Um, and when I just see them, I mean, we just had a, a, many groups of children come for the past several school committee meetings to recognitions. Mm -hmm. It's so outstanding, the achievements in so many areas that our students are, are being successful in, yep. that it truly is you know, a challenge for us to make sure that we can keep up with them um, and keep up with them. And not even being one step ahead, sometimes <laughs> it's just, maybe sometimes it's you know, pushing them from behind, but um, they're, yeah. you know, they're self-starters. Self and I've said this many, many times before when we talk about the support that we enjoy in this community, our children come to us from such supportive, dedicated, involved families. Mm -hmm. Our families know what's going on in our schools. They really care about sending their student to school ready to learn. Um, and, and we feel it. We know it. We yeah. know that you know, we have got this group of students that we're very responsible mm -hmm. to make sure that we do our very best for. So all of those things that you point out come from, that's the source of it, that's the motivation. Yeah, and I am really um, blessed to be able to walk through the school halls and see exactly what you're saying. I mean, the kids are collaborating. They're like, I walk by rooms and there's incredible music coming out of there, or they're all working with like, you know, glasses on projects and things. It's just a really vibrant, dynamic community it really is. And, is and i just i just i want to do a shout out here for for this show yeah um because one of our school committee members recently gene birchman had uh sent jim and i an email basically saying that she had just caught up on all of the episodes and actually she and i were talking about this again yesterday that gene's been on the school committee i think for nine years mm -hmm. um and she said that she had learned things through watching these episodes that even she didn't know. Mm -hmm. And she's a very informed, very involved school committee member um, who's been involved for many years. So I think this, this Highlights from the Hill gives everybody an opportunity to have just a little bit more insight when you talk about walking down the hallways and yeah. just seeing what go goes on on a typical day mm -hmm. um, in a way that you otherwise wouldn't be able to have. So right. thank you for that. Yep, yep. So again, I just want to echo the volunteers in this town are amazing. In fact, I, I'm sure that in our short list, we have left off, you know, several oh. that at some point we're really going to come back and recognize because it's awesome what they do. And, exactly. and thanks to everyone in the community. Thank you for watching this episode and being a part of our community. We'll see you next time on Highlights from the Hill. You have what it takes.
will you make a difference? Always an adventure. Police and fire working together. Utilizing the latest technology. Do you have what it takes? Hi, my name is Margie Wigan, and I want to invite you to join me for my new show, Character Matters, on HCAM. We're going to talk about why do people choose the behavior that they choose? Why do they choose to be good? We're going to hear from people in history. We're going to hear from local heroes who make great choices. And we're going to hear from some puppets who talk about things they've seen, and they're going to say, what? Did you see that? Yes, I did. Please join us. Have you ever considered texting and driving? If so, you should know the consequences. If caught texting and driving for the first time, you could get in a $100 fine plus your license taken away for 60 days. The consequences only get worse the more you get caught. Even if you don't get caught, there could be serious effects. You could get into a car accident and hurt yourself or someone else. Texting and driving is a very dangerous combination, so stop before this happens to you. Hello, my name is Officer John Corden of the Hopkins Union Police Department. I am here to explain some important information regarding opiate overdoses under the Good Samaritan Law, Chapter 94C, Section 34A. First, a person who in good faith seeks medical assistance for someone experiencing a drug-related overdose shall not be charged or prosecuted for possession of a controlled substance. Second, a person who experiences a drug-related overdose and in good faith either seeks medical assistance or other seeking assistance shall not be charged or prosecuted for possession of a controlled substance. Third, the act of seeking medical assistance for someone who is experiencing a drug-related overdose may be used as a mitigating factor in a criminal prosecution under the Controlled Substance Act. Lastly, a person acting in good faith may receive a Narcan prescription and administer it to an individual appearing to be experiencing an opiate-related overdose. For more information, please contact the Hopkinton Police Department or Denise Hildreth, Director of Youth and Family Services. Thank you.